Welcome to our August 2022 discussion group. And we are back in the book of Proverbs. Remember that book? Uh, it feels like a long time since we've been in the book of Proverbs, but we're in chapter 22, chapter 22. And it has 29 verses, so it'll probably take us a couple weeks to go through it. And then we'll go back to another discussion topic. So you can be thinking about what you might want to talk about and discuss next. Um, but before we get started and I share my screen, I'm going to have Joan open with prayer. So thank you so much. Oh, our loving God, you are so good. You know, just the right time to to work things out and just hearing the story about Pat's truck. And um, after Mark was, I didn't know that part of it, but as Mark preached on Sunday, talking about all the times that they have been blessed and they have blessed other people with vehicles. And it just um, shows that you care about every little detail in our lives. And we just thank you for that. We thank you for intervening at the right time and working things out. Um, if we just trust you, we don't have to worry. Uh, we, we don't have to try and work things out ourselves because you, you know what's best. So we just thank you, we give you praise. And uh, we just thank you for being here this evening with us. We ask you to bless, um, bless our study, our time together. Just open our eyes and open our minds and our hearts to understand what we're reading in the book of Proverbs. And so we just place it all in your hands and just give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And we prayed in Virginia. Very nice. Awesome. I Welcome. remember one time we had a big station wagon. We sold it to friends of ours for a dollar. Yep. That's, so, yeah. That's the kind of thing you do, which is happened to us. And we're, we're yeah. going to do it for others, which is a blessing. It's wonderful. <clears throat> when my mom and dad got their house in Oceanside, they bought it from the Nazarene church for a dollar, mm -hmm. a house. And then when they left there and went to Worldwide, they sold it back to the Nazarene church for a dollar. <laughs> all right. Well, welcome to um, all of you. Proverbs 22, 1. We're just going to go verse by verse as we have done in the past. If you have commentaries, other translations that you'd like to open up and get ready. It's what makes our discussion rich and um, full. So we're starting in 22.1, and I'll be reading from the NIV, and then I would love to hear your translations that you have tonight, and if you have any commentaries as well. So verse 1, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. And I feel like we've, we've covered a, a proverb very, very similar to this. And if I remember correctly, we talked about how a name means our reputation and our character. You all, would you all agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, so a good name. Uh, the new century says being respected is more important than having great riches. Yeah. Okay, so being so um, respected, which is has to do with a good reputation. Yeah. So, how do how do we have a respectful reputation, or a how are we known for our good name? I think one way is keeping your word. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, treating other people um, with respect and with concern. Right. So if you show someone that you care about them and, and what, you know, what's best for them, that they're going to have, that's going to give you a better reputation. Yeah, that, that's good. Treating others <clears throat> with the respect that you would want to be attached to your name. Yeah. Yeah. Treating others as you would have them. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't know. Is there anything else to add to this or <laughs> that pretty much cover it? Well, um, 
in I've got the enduring word commentary and it brought up kind of a different thought. Hmm. It says, while it is true that reputation and the affection of others are more desirable than great riches, we must not forget that they may be in themselves vanity and a snare. The only honor that is safe is that which comes from God. So we have to be careful that, you know, with being seen good in other people's eyes doesn't become, you know, yeah. vanity. That we don't get prideful in our yes. good yeah. name. I'm so glad you said that because it does seem like some harm can be done. We've seen this in movies and different things where a family is so prideful about, you know, you're not going to tarnish my reputation when their daughter gets pregnant mm -hmm. out of wedlock or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually they disown the disown child the child and they child. they sever the relationship mm -hmm. because they don't want their reputation tarnished. So I was I was trying to figure out how to ask that question. So I'm really glad that you you read that. Um, so really. Uh, the focus on that commentary they were saying um focusing on god's character is that what no what god thinks what, what god thinks right the only okay. honor that is safe is that which comes from god so we need to care uh, more about what god thinks of us than other people there's a, yeah. a there's there's a verse in the new testament about jesus when he was young that he was strong and spirit and grew in esteem and favor with god and man Mm. yeah in the king james the second part of that to be esteemed is better than silver or gold the king james says and loving favor rather than silver and gold oh interesting loving yeah, favor. Loving favor right. virginia did you have your hand up one way uh you can do that is respect yourself yourself and others and treat others with the same respect and dignity the way you want to be treated. And I don't know what scripture, but it says, think of yourself less than you think of others. Mm -hmm. And if you think like that, you won't, you know, you'll respect people, respect you. If you're not caught judging people, or, you know, belittling people, whatever. So look at them as they are better than you. Yeah. That's what Paul said. He said, let every man esteem others better than themselves. Exactly. Right? You're right. Paul said that too. Yep. Yeah. So that's good. I think, you know, the, the summary of that would be, we, we want <laughs> to have a good reputation, but really it's, it's loving God and loving our neighbor, right? That's the reputation we want. And the most important thing is, is what God thinks of us, not yeah. what our neighbor thinks. I mean, although we want them to think well of us, that's not the end goal. It can't be, or else then we start making prideful kinds of human decisions <laughs> on how we act you know trying to impress right instead of instead of just letting god see god sees our heart <laughs> i can't trick him or fool him or impress him really so very good all right well let's move on to number two or number two verse two rich and poor have this in common the lord is the maker of them all how about that for an equalizer <laughs> So rich, both for both rich and poor, the Lord is the maker of them all. And that could go for, for all kinds of different things, right? Skin color, uh, socioeconomic, not just socioeconomic, but skin color, gender, nationality, nationality, religion, rich and poor have this in common. Yeah. Well, there, what's that other scripture? I'm not, I don't remember exactly where it is, but it rains on the just and unjust. Yes. You know exactly um the message says the rich and the poor shake hands as equals ah god made them both which where was that at in the commentary no, that's message. the message oh that's the message i like that the rich and poor shake hands <laughs> as equals as equals yeah the lord is the maker of all of us it's good to keep that in mind right when we're mm -hmm. tempted to look down on other people because for whatever reason all right verse three the prudent see danger and take refuge but the simple keep going and pay the penalty all right anybody else have another translation 
prudent person sees trouble coming and ducks. A and ducks? Of, ducks. Mm -hmm. Yes. A simpleton walks in blindly and is clobbered. Oh, wow. <laughs> I love that. What, what, what um, translation is that? Oh, that's, the, that's the message. Oh, the message. That's I love not... that. <laughs> ducks and cl gets clobbered. Yeah. Oh, it, it, blindly walk into trouble, I guess. Mm. <laughs> You know, the new century says fools keep going and get into trouble. So um, yeah. get the, the wise see the danger ahead and they avoid it. And I the, like ducks and gets clobbered. <laughs> I know. Um, in my commentary, it says the simple pass on and are punished. The foolish and simple man doesn't have the ability to perceive danger and respond correctly. Mm -hmm. They must endure more evil because of this. Wow. <laughs> So they haven't learned to, to see danger when it's right before them. What makes a person simple in this, in this context? A simpleton. Yeah, that's, I mean, are they born that way or are, is it by choice? And how do you become prudent? Well, I think part would be they weren't taught by their parents. Okay, that very well could be. Yeah. How do we? There are a few other places in the Bible where the word, uh, the Hebrew word prudent is mentioned. It's like a, we read about it in Proverbs 12. A prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaims foolishness. Every prudent man deals with knowledge. Uh, the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. Um, the prudent, uh, the simple believe every word, but the prudent man looks well to his going. Um, and actually, this I notice that this proverb is exactly repeated in Proverbs 12, uh, 27 12. Oh, is it? Proverbs. Uh, so it must be important. 47 12. Okay. Tw 27 12. Oh, 27 12. Okay. Mm. Yeah, there is no 47. <laughs> <laughs> So would, would wise be another word for prudent, do you think? I think so. Um, yeah. The Hebrew word is, is, um, is um, arum. 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 Yeah. Arum. 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 A-R-U-M. Arum. A-R-U-M. Hebrew arum. Yeah, so, I mean, I see this to be true in life. It's just hard to know, like, where where to place the blame, if you will, you know? It's like, I guess the goal is to just be, to continually be seeking wisdom. Because, you know, I guess it, it all, at some point, all of us could be a simpleton, right? Blindly walk into things and and aren't seeking wisdom. Naivete is another. Naivete, sense. okay. In the other Proverbs, it, it gives a contrast, uh, like the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. And, uh, I spell that right. The simple believes every word, but the prudent man looks like he's doing it. It's contrasted what the simple, what, what the, uh, the fools does. So I guess if you could, See what the fool does, don't do that. <laughs> you be prudent. Right. So naive goes up with the simple part, not the prudent part. Oh yeah, you know right. Thank you. So I guess I guess the point is to to see always be a learner, always be seeking seeking wisdom. Um and teach your children how to do the same thing, right? Simpleton. And of course ask God. For wisdom. Yeah, ask right and for, for a room. You learner, ask God. Come on, for wisdom, teach your children to seek wisdom. You know, uh, that uh, brings up something I was thinking of Proverbs in a new light lately. You normally think of it as the wise man telling the world, young people, what to how to have a a good life, but in the beginning it says about my son. <clears throat> it is like a father <clears throat> because he loves his son. He's giving this knowledge, not just 
for for some practical reason, but well, it's practical, but I mean, it's there are a lot. It's a love thing for it's him, love and thing. I can't I can't help think that Jesus, when he saw that living by every word of God, uh, he would see the Father giving him this advice to know how to live this life mm. in the flesh. That's beautiful. And the Proverbs seems more, it's more of a love gift than just a, a rules and instructions. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. I like that, Stanley. That's excellent. It's a love thing. That's beautiful. Well, let's look at verse four. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. Yeah, humility is, doesn't it say humility somewhere, is the beginning of wisdom? Is that a? Fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Oh, and this is saying humility is the fear of the Lord. So does anybody else have a different translation? King James says, and is italicized. Humility and the fear of the Lord. Oh, King James Version says humility and? Well, at least this online version. Okay. Is. And the fear of the Lord. Oh, oh Stephanie's giving a thumbs up. Yep. yep. Uh, John? In the commentary, it says um, these two qualities, humility and fear of the Lord, are connected. Humility is a proper view of self. Yes. Fear of the Lord is a proper view of God. Ah. The person who has these two qualities is well on their way on the path to wisdom. Oh, I like that. That's a commentary? Yeah, this is Enduring Word Bible Commentary. I love it. It's got, it has comments from different commentaries, you know, um, but it, uh, you can, any, any book in the Bible, you can go to it and pull this up. It's just, uh, I found it very useful. That's excellent. Because that, I have heard that um, humility, that definition before, that hum humility is a proper view of yourself. It's not beating yourself up and, mm -hmm. you know, oh, I'm such a worm and that kind of thing. It's not elevating yourself. It's having a proper, um, realistic view of who you are. Which is a child of God. Which is a child of God, right. Oh, right. So you don't have to fake humility. Um, you just don't, you don't own it because you didn't create yourself and you have a, a realistic view of, of, of who to give credit to <laughs> fear of the Lord is a proper view of God. Yeah, that's good. Really like that. I wonder if that enduring word Bible commentary is online. Well, that's where I'm reading it. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I thought, I thought you had, a I don't know. No, oh no, no, it's I'm. I don't know how I found it, whether it was from Bible Gateway or what, but uh, I found it quite a while ago, and I just keep it up nice. on my computer. Anything else on verse four, or shall we go into five? Humility, I mean, we could talk all day about humility, what it is and why we need it. It's, we have talked a lot about it. It's interesting. It says the wages are riches and honor and life. So humility has good outcomes. It doesn't, it doesn't sell well. <laughs> you know, if you're a humble leader, the whole world attacks you for being too weak, you know, but I respect and admire humility. I love to see humility um, displayed. It's attractive to me. Arrogance is not attractive. Well, let's go to verse five then. In the paths of the wicked are snares and pitfalls, but those who would preserve their life stay far from them. In the paths of the wicked are snares and pitfalls, but those who would preserve their life stay far from them. Again, I think this is another description of wisdom. You know, that's, that's wisdom. You look down the road, you go, ooh, there's a lot of pitfalls here. Don't think I want to go down that road. I'm just going to go this way. <laughs> That's what I always used to tell our kids. And I remember those conversations with Megan specifically because um, she's a watcher. She's always been like a learner. When she was little, she would just kind of sit under the table and play with her Barbies and listen to everything we would be talking about. And she would take it all in. And she just learned 
by listening to like everybody else and what they were doing. And she was able to have wisdom to not make a lot of the, some, some people just have to do it themselves. You know, it's like they have to experience the hard, the school of hard knocks, we call it. But, um, but wisdom has a blessing because you don't end up having to bonk your head on the brick wall so many times. Uh, anybody have a, a thought on this verse or another translation or way of looking at it? That was just the first thing that came to my mind. The Amplified, it says, thorns and snares are in the way of the obstinate and the willful. Mm. He who guards himself will be far from them. So obstinate, willful, you were saying arrogant. Yeah. Yeah. If you're oh. in that mindset, there's going to be traps along the way and you may not see them because you're so set and yeah. that you're right. <laughs> Interesting. Maybe these two verses go together humility mm -hmm. is the fear of the lord its wages are riches right. honor and life but in the path of the wicked are snares and pitfalls and those who preserve their life stay far from them the king james calls them perverse yeah. perverse mm -hmm. yeah. in what way can you read the well the actually <clears throat> forward. and i wasn't sure what forward fro forward meant <laughs> but in the in the in the margin it says perverse can you read instead, you of, just instead read of wicked thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse, perverse. oh okay perverse I see. he that keeps his soul or has wisdom um shall be far from them yeah the voice uses that word perverse thorny branches and traps lie ahead for those who follow perverse paths hmm. so uh, okay yeah. and so is this heard. right on your screen forward is that how you Correct. yeah yeah that's it there it goes. it means twisted distorted twisted distorted okay crooked perverse distorted okay <clears throat> oh did you have your hand that were you waving your hand virginia the 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 uh, message says the perverse travel a dangerous road, pothole, and mud slicks. If you know what's good for you, stay clear of it. Stay clear. <laughs> you know That's wisdom. Good. Stay clear. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Let's put that down here. Let's see. And stay clear. <laughs> Okay, start children off in the way they should go. This is um, verse six. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. This is that one. Train, this, train up a child. This is the train up a child, right? Is that what it says in the yeah. King James? Yep. Yeah, that's what King James says. This is a well, well known memory verse, or quoted yeah. at least. Um, I, I, I rely on that verse heavily. <laughs> so um does anybody else have a, a yeah jump did you are you raising well, um chuck swindoll had a different take on this verse i heard years ago he said um you train up the child uh in the, he talked about the bent oh, the, the bent. way that the child is you learn what what is you know how your child Th thinks and learns and if you train them up according to that they're going to have you know a better time as they get older whereas if you push them in the wrong the direction that's against their nature then they're going to have problems so um i always found that interesting that i remember he hearing that oh it does oh i'm sorry the amplified says train up train up a child in the way he should go and in keeping with his individual gift or bent. So that ah. was in the Amplified. So, so that's, you have to learn about your children and every child is different. And, and it's true, you know, how they learn and how they react to things. Like you were saying, mm -hmm. Megan would just sit and listen. Yeah, <laughs> and I didn't teach her that. I mean, maybe no. a little, but really that was just a teacher yeah right yeah camden's a doer he, he goes out and has to do everything try everything out you know mm -hmm. virginia you need to say something 
Yeah, the amp, the amp. Point your kid in the right direction. When they are old, they won't be lost. Interesting. Yeah, okay. I like that. That's you know, the amplified? Think, no, this is the message. Oh, that's the message. Okay. I just think children, um, a lot of times, I think it has a lot to do with different personalities because some personalities take risks. You know, they just go for it. I was reading an article about, uh, I forgot what they said about them, but they take risks. You know, that's a big risk to be the president yeah. of a, a country. Oh, yeah. And some children, you know, a lot of the presidents are probably have that personality type. You got to take risks. Yep. And a bold, bold and courageous. Anybody's right. not going to be a president. That's so true. <laughs> Or, you know, a stunt double or, a, you know, you think about all the different jobs out there that take different giftings. And I think not, we just, we're not all the same. So learning who your kids are and figuring out how to parent them according to their individual personality, that's not an easy task. <laughs> but definitely, especially when you're talking about, when you're talking about introducing them to God and um, working with their personality and their gifting. That's a, it's a real task, <laughs> but you know, I, a lot of people see this as a promise, of course, you know, that if you raise them right, you know, raise them, raise them going to church that when they're old, they won't turn from it. I'm not sure if that's what this is, but it could be, um, that you do see a lot of people come back to church when they're older. I've seen this. They'll come back in their 40s or 50s or even after that and they're like you know my mom always taught me about God when I was little but I just ran and did my own thing and and now you know I still believe in a God but you know I just haven't really been following him and I want to follow him now you know I've seen that before so that could be another um, ex explanation or um, application of this verse it's very comforting yeah it is absolutely absolutely Yes, Virginia. I, I think God honors parents when you do your best to teach your children, you know, right. Then I think later in life, they're not mature enough. They're going to do things about the hair or whatever. But eventually he, they come back because I grew up, you know, in a large family in a, in a neighborhood. So I knew some of the children that I knew the parents were Christian. They went out there and did things. But some of them that did the worst thing came back and they become, became a preacher. <laughs> you know, they're teaching others about God. Right. So I just think it's the personality, you know, we're not always mature enough to understand the information that we receive from parents. We might need to know whatever. But I just believe that a good parent, somewhere God is going to honor that parent for doing the right things. And he's going to honor the fact that we messed it up too, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't say honor it. He's going, he's going to make up for our weaknesses because right. we just don't get it right. Let's just be honest. We've all made mistakes in parenting and um, thank goodness our kids belong to him first, you know, mm -hmm. because if it was all up to us and our great parenting, we'd all be done for. So, you know, when I look at this verse, I kind of think about, the promise that, that my kids belong to him first. And at the end of the day, God gets the last word and God is loving and merciful. And um, we don't know how he's going to work it all out in the end for some of our kids who maybe who have run away from God or just doing their own thing or, or, you know, maybe don't even believe he exists. Like we, we take comfort in knowing who our good father is and that, um, and that he will have mercy over over our humanness, our human parenting. <laughs> so yeah, we take comfort in that, definitely. Anything else on that verse? I don't want to rush through that, but if we're done, okay. Um, verse seven, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. That is so true, isn't it? I mean, we see that in our country. When you, when you have to borrow money, which we all do, you, you are a slave to whoever lent, lent you the money. And um, 
And if you live your whole life in debt, you end up paying for that debt. <laughs> you end up paying for, for not having money. Sometimes you can't help it. But um, as a principle, the people that are loaning the money are definitely the masters over the people that are borrowing it. I think that's kind of the bottom line on that one. Does anybody have a, that's true. a thought on that? I mean, think about it. You're not working for the money you make off of loaning somebody money. <laughs> you're, you're making money off the fact that you have money and they don't. So you loan it to them and then you charge them to loan it to them. And if you, if you're one of these little check cashing places that charges like exorbitant amounts for the poor people that are in there trying to get a, a forward on their paycheck and what do they pay like 30%? Uh, is it that much? It's, it's, it's high. It's it's high. high. You, you can never get ahead because you're, you're, you're always having to borrow money and pay extra just for the, the little bit of money you, have, you get. So anybody have a thought on, on this? Well, yes. from the commentary, it says the point is that one must regard indebtedness only as a last resort, mm. and in parentheses, wary of those who offer to lend money, and endeavor to get out of debt as rapidly as possible. Debt is debilitating and demoralizing. So, I know you and Mark, way back, I don't know how long ago that was, when you set out to get all your you know debt paid off your credit cards whatever and right. get on a cash basis not everybody can do that but it's, yeah it, but some can it just takes discipline and to not spend money that you you know you, you don't need to spend not buying things that you don't need right at the end of the day you end up mm. trying to get rid of all that stuff yeah <laughs> in a right. garage full of stuff that you bought that you really like, what, Why, what do I do with all this stuff? That's all I, I yeah. think about now. Is yeah. Why did I accumulate all this stuff or what? Yeah. It's, it's, it's difficult, you know, and I'm glad there are lenders for the times when you, you know, like now we have two cars. We never could have bought our two cars that we had unless we, you know, were able to borrow money. Um, but we are indebted to them and we are paying for those loans, you know, we're paying interest. I think, yeah, the bottom line is, is when you are in debt to somebody or some agency, they are your master. They're one of your masters, you know, not, not the master, but you definitely are connected and tied to them for sure. Any other thoughts on this? Well, you know, we should, it says here we should uh, try and be a lender and not a borrower. And then that gets into another whole thing about if we're, I've learned if you lend money to someone, don't lend money unless you can, it can be a gift. Or yeah. to lose it. And, you know, right. if you expect to get it back, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've learned that. Especially if it's somebody you know, which it usually so, yeah, it usually is. Someone you know or it can ruin a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And so once you lend money to someone, um, you know, it's just forget about it. And if you can't, don't lend it. Yep. It's easy to it's it's easy to give somebody money uh -huh. and, and you have more freedom and peace. Yeah. Because you don't, you're not looking for it back. But if you, if you give, if you loan it to them and they promise that they will pay, pay it back, you're going to be frustrated because they made you a promise. It's rough. And they're going and to they be it. guilty. <laughs> they're going to feel guilty because they That's aren't right. able to pay it back. Yeah. So there and goes the relationship. Watch, you watch the way they spend <laughs> their money and they're out. You know, buying things and new shoes. Going and you're like, movies, hey, hey, going, you owe me money. Going to movies. You know, going to movies. Like, <laughs> I don't even go to movies. You owe me money. Why are you spending, you know, not, it, yeah, it's, we've been in that situation before and it is not fun. Because then you become, it puts, it puts yeah, tension in your relationship. Yes. You're, now you're judging them because you're like, look, you owe me money. So you you anyway, God. You're not paying me, but you're going out to movies and out to eat and, you know, you should be sacrificing and paying me back and then you can go out. To, 
you know, and that's, yeah, I just rather not be in that situation. That's rough. Sometimes people borrow money from you and you tell them not to worry about it, but they promise, promise they're going to give it back. (laughs) And, and they don't understand that they're not the, anyway, that's what they do. They borrow money. I knew a a girl, a lady years ago, she borrowed money from everybody on the base. Oh no. (laughs) And she, Everybody angry because she just keep borrowing money, keep borrowing money. It was a habit. She she realized that the people would. She had this pitiful look, and she asked for money. You know, oh, I'm going to give it right back. Mm-mm. I mean, come on, right back. <laughs> <laughs> you could give it right back. You wouldn't be borrowing it. <laughs> back to the bank. Everybody on the base knew her. Oh, she that's bad. everybody's. Pocket. That's that goes back to verse one. That's a bad reputation. <laughs> Well, it also goes back to one of those other verses. Yeah. Being simple and naive and and, you, and you, loaning money to you somebody. Get, you get yep. clobbered. Yep. Yeah, that's a clobber. All right. Well, let's go to verse eight. Whoever sows injustice reaps calamity, and the rod they wield in fury will be broken. So we're talking about injustice here. Whoever sows injustice reaps calamity. And the rod they wield in fury, anger, right, will be broken. The the next verse, maybe we should do this together. The generous will be themselves be blessed for they share their food with the poor. So it's like, I kind of feel like these kind of go together. We're talking about injustice and um, a strong arm, right, wielding a rod and fury and then That's the generous the being blessed mm-hmm. and sharing what they have with the poor yeah any thoughts on these two verses do you think they go together yes whoever sows sin we please i think they go together i have in the message it said whoever sows sin we weeds and bully and angers sputter into nothing Generous hands are blessed to the poor. Mm-hmm. That's what we want to be. We want to be a blessing to the to the poor. So we're talking about injustice. And anybody else have an, another translation of of a rod wielded in fury? Yeah. Yeah. What is that? The voice says, "Those who sow injustice reap disaster, and their methods of oppression will fail." Okay, so a method of oppression. Generous people are genuinely blessed because they share their food with the poor. So it's a contrast. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the New Living says those who plant injustice will harvest disaster and their reign of terror will come to an end. Oh, so w- the rod they wield is the reign of terror. King James says, he that sows iniquity shall reap vanity. Mm -hmm. And then then in the margin, I think it says trouble or something. And then what does it say in verse 9 about the generous? It says, um, well, it it calls it a bountiful eye. But in in the margin, then it says generous. Okay. Bountiful. Yeah, I think, you know, I think we all know and understand this, that we are, that we want to have generous hearts and not um, oppress people. I think um, overall that would be, we would see that as the way of Jesus, right? He came to set the, to set the oppressed free and um, to bring abundant life to those that don't have it. Any other thoughts on these two verses? You know, how how we live this out in our daily life. That's a, you know, that that's probably a topic that could take a whole evening of, you know, I know, I know some people who won't buy from certain stores because they have cheap items because they're, they use cheap child labor in other countries and they just won't they believe it's unethical. So that's kind of their way of 
pushing up against oppression, you know, or, you know, they know like to have a certain type of chocolate, these little kids, you know, they use kids because their fingers are small to, and they work them 12 to 14 hours a day and it's oppressive. And so when they find those things out, now that we're a global community, we can find these things out. They refuse to buy certain brands because that's oppression. So, I mean, there are different ways to fight against injustice and oppression. Um, and then of course there are ways to be generous that, you know, besides just actually going to an honest street and handing out a sandwich to somebody, but you can actually, you know, give to organizations that take care of um, people that are in poverty and that kind of thing. But definitely that would be our heartbeat. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I think we would all agree that we want to live generous lives. It's just how we do it. That's something we have to wrestle with with God and ask him, you know, sometimes it is rolling down our window and handing somebody our sandwich or our, a granola bar, bottle of water, um, or, you know, giving a donation to an organization that's doing good work. Let's see, we have, I think we started at five after, so we got about 10 minutes. We'll go ahead and go on to verse 10. Drive out the mocker and out goes strife. Quarrels and insults are ended. The mocker. Oh, well, uh, this might go with 11. I don't know. What do you think? Because when you read 11, it says, one who loves Quarrels a pure insult. heart and who speaks with grace will have a, the king for a friend. So you've got a mocker who uses words as to quarrel and insult people. And you have somebody with a pure heart who speaks with grace and um, they have a king for a friend. Yeah, what do you think of that? Makes sense. I have uh, for the message that says, kick out the troublemakers and things will quiet <laughs> down. You need to break, you need a break from bickering and griping. And then, <laughs> One of the usages for a mocker is talks arrogantly. Oh, really? To boast. Mocker. Um, to boast. Talks arrogantly. Wow. So I always think of mocking like making fun of, but yeah, I can see the, the arrogant part of it. Um, were you finished reading, Virginia, or did you have more to read on that? Is that, did you want me to read 11? Yeah, I read 11. God loves the pure hearted and well spoken. Good leaders also delight in their friendship. Ah. Uh, and that's the message. Yeah, good leaders. So, so that would be king. Peacemakers. <laughs> yeah. Pure heart. One who loves a pure heart and he speaks with grace. Boy, isn't that, isn't that, wouldn't that like, we'd all like to be that person, right? Who has mm -hmm. a pure heart and speaks with, we love a pure heart, not just having a pure heart. We love other people with a pure heart and we speak with grace. Love having a pure heart. Some people make fun of people that have a pure heart. You know, the world thinks that's mm -hmm. foolishness. Ah, uh, you're a pushover. You're too soft. You're too kind. You're too compassionate. That is so true. Yeah, it's true. You know, you get what you, you know, it's just a different way of living, pushing your way to the top and um, trying to have a pure heart and speak words of grace isn't always respected in our culture. Any other thoughts on this? Drive out the mocker. And out goes strife. Yeah, that would be true. <laughs> you, you know, have you ever had like a contentious kind of a environment and then the person who is really critical and insulting and arrogant, once they leave, it's like, ah, peace at last, you know? And um, one who loves a pure heart, speaks with grace, will have a king for a friend. Well, Good 
advice. Solomon or whoever wrote this section of scripture. Um, let's look at verse 12. The eyes of the Lord keep watch over knowledge, but he frustrates the words of the unfaithful. The eyes of the Lord keep watch over knowledge. What do you think that means? But he frustrates the words of the unfaithful. Unfaithful in mind says faithless. This is um, wait a minute. That sounds like this a is in 12, it says God. God guards knowledge with a passion, but he'll have nothing to do with deception. Oh. Deception. Is that unfaithful? Is that, hmm, I wonder. Let's see what the other one said. Is that the message? Yes. Hmm. Can you read it again? God guards knowledge with a passion. But he'll have nothing to do with deception. Hmm. That's interesting. I'm going to put that in there. That's the message. Yeah. The King James uses the word transgressor. Oh, yeah. Transgressor for unfaithful? Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, here it's used for the, in place of the word faithless. Faithless. Okay. There's a difference between unfaithful and faithless. I don't know. I mean, faithless is not having any faith at all. And unfaithful is just not, not living in faith. Yeah. <laughs> not walking somehow, by it, not... somehow it seems there's a difference, but I don't does, know. Maybe I'm all does seem different, doesn't it? Anybody else have another translation that would help us with this verse? I like that. Guards. God guards knowledge with a passion. Yeah. But he'll have nothing to do with deception. With a passion. Nice. I like that. Yeah, that's probably that. I think that makes sense. It's a good translation. Understanding. Anybody else have anything to add to this? Okay. We'll move on. Just maybe a couple more. We've got four minutes to the top of the hour. Um, the sluggard says, there's a line outside. I'll be killed in the public square. This is <laughs> an excuse for not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> right? It seems oddly out of it place. It does seem oddly out of place. What we talked about just now and then what's coming up next. Right? The mouth of an adulterous woman is in a deep pit. Yeah, I don't know. Range. Interesting. You have your commentaries open? Yeah, it says, um, this is the cry of the lazy man. In his, uh -huh. in his imagination, the outside world and the work required to function in it are so frightening that it is best avoided. His excuse <laughs> is crazy and absurd, but such is the refuge of the lazy man. Uh-huh. Wow. <laughs> wow you'll find whatever excuse works <laughs> oh my goodness mm -hmm. <clears throat> says the sluggard is represented as finding fantastic and preposterous excuses excuses to demonstrate that no idea is too odd or fantastic to him to keep him off welfare <laughs> his life and the community is not in danger from his phantom lion in the streets, but from his lazy lifestyle. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. The sluggard says, there's a line outside, I'll be killed in the public square. I can't go out there and work. Yeah, inventing <laughs> a fantastic reason for not going about his business. In, oh, inventing a fancy, what'd you say? Say that again. Inventing a fantastic reason for not going about his business. <laughs> wow oh, boy he, he's a slothful man remove slothful. his slothfulness and these imaginary difficulties and dangers will be no more <laughs> oh. wow hmm. wow 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 yep. seen that any other thoughts on the sluggard Cry of a lazy man. 
Any ideas on how to make somebody not be lazy? <laughs> oh boy. That seems like an inward. Hmm. I don't know. Can you change a lazy person? I just don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. I mean, it's repeated in Proverbs 26 13. It is yeah. Proverbs 26 13. Yeah. There's a lot about laziness in the Proverbs, isn't there? Uh huh. He that does a neat work should neat. Right. Actually, I don't think that that one's out of place. It's the next one that sounds out of place to me. But that goes along with, I mean, a slothful man, his eyes are not on God. He doesn't love pureness. He's a, he's a scorner, a mocker. He's not, doesn't have a generous eye. He, you know, you see what I'm saying? So yeah. I, I, think that, I think that does go with the rest of them. It's verse 14 that's out of place. <laughs> I yeah. think. Hmm. Well, maybe we'll pick up 14 next time then. We'll dig into that. The mouth of the adulterous woman is a deep pit. The man who falls under the Lord's wrath falls into it. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Chew on that one this week. Yeah. <laughs> Falling into the mouth of the adulterous woman. <laughs> well, the King James says strange. And then in the and then in the margin, it says an immoral woman. So yeah. same thing, I guess but it uses strange, <laughs> strange. Interesting. I mean, you can be strange in a lot of ways without being immoral. I don't, whatever, right. but. Okay. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll highlight this. This is where we'll pick up next time. If you have other thoughts on this, look into the, the original language, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, well, was that helpful today? Just. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminders of general wisdom and truths, things that are generally true. It's good to, it's kind of good to just rest in it and read through it and chew on it, cogitate. And, you know, maybe it'll help us make better decisions as we go throughout the week. You know, we, one thing that's easy to do in the book of Proverbs is go, well, those, those dumb Sluggard. sluggards or those, fools. you know, fools. And it's easy to get kind of, you know, us and them about it. And, and, you know, and the truth is we all have a little bit of all of that in us. The and Lord is the maker of us all. The Lord is the maker of us all. We did read that tonight. And, <laughs> you know, really for all of us to just rest in his mercy and his grace, the Proverbs often don't, um, I think they do generally point to God's grace, but you can get into the minutia and get really like, well, those dumb people, you know, why would they do that? And they should do this. And, and I, I never want to lose sight of God's grace and his mercy that covers all of it. You know, these are general principles that are true most of the time. And if we live a life, you know, in the kingdom of heaven, striving to live a life with a heart toward God, we're going to have a better go of things we're not going to make our own calamity as much <laughs> there will be things that happen to us there will be calamity that happens to us but um a lot of people bring calamity on themselves just by the way they live and we don't want to be like that but we want to have mercy on the people that do live like that because that's what god would have us do so um on that note would anyone like to close us out and just ask for God's mercy to be upon us? Thank you, Stephanie. Our most heavenly father, thank you so much for bringing us together again tonight to study your word. Help us to take everything that we've heard and as much as lies within us, put it into practice. Amen. We need your help. We know we always have your help. And we thank you for that. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Nice prayer. Amen. Amen. All right. I'll stop recording, but feel I'll free to stay on.